Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased that I get to sit back and then let these two do cruise control as we kind of go into this case for near term removals. But I, I do want to acknowledge that we all are just the same. Of the different types. 
And also, on top of that, you get, you know, I, so I am the day I represent the corporate buyer, okay, in this situation. I also advise some funds, but let's for right now just wear my corporate buyer hat. Now, a lot of you work for, how many of you work for like corporations that aren't uh, exclusively focused on working in carbon or climate? Just, you know, your tech companies, your, okay. Yeah, I couple end up here, great. <laughs> I mean, I ended up here, that's a very long story, but I did end up here. And I can tell you right now that the majority of our CFO, our CEO, our C-suite team, our board of directors, um, they're just still understanding climate change, right? They're focused on everything else. So when you come to them with an opportunity of a removal and a decarbonization target, you've actually just got to be quite basic about what you're even trying to achieve and how you're trying to achieve it. Um, and so the case for removals for us was really as easy as the one analogy uh, around the bathtub, right? So say that you're going, and you're running a bath in your house, and uh, uh oh, the tub is flowing over. What's the very first thing you do? You turn off the bath water, right? And then you remove it too. You'd have to do both of these at once. Not get mold on the floor, and if you just uh, clean up the stuff on the floor, it's going to keep coming if you don't turn off the hose or what's the faucet. Um, and so for us, it was always like coupling the two, and then making the case for that removing the water off the floor. Um, for me personally, I always choose AXO carbon and kind of regenerative types of removal so that fits into like the biochar, the enhanced rock weathering. And just to be totally transparent with you, it's because it's near and dear to my heart. And I think it also likens it back to the nature piece, which your comment earlier about whale poop, like really gets at the hearts of people who absolutely don't talk about this on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so then, of course, then it's our job as the, well, on the more technical side to work with people who are in the technical space to understand how to pair that and the different types of durability and um, permanence levels with these different types of methodologies into a way that makes good sense for a decarbonization strategy. And, and I appreciate that because I think last night, maybe I don't know why I did talking about this, and I think removal does all the purpose and such an eloquent picture of what it's like to be like, conceptualized what Gigaton removal looks like. Does anyone have a cup of water in the room? Anybody? Someone's drinking water. Anyway, the whole point is. There it is. There it is. From the act person. Yeah. Right okay, look at that. So, we're looking at what a cup of water might re represent as a megaton removal. Small. And the thing that we get to is megaton. We're looking at the major room of the water, the varying size. This needs to be filled with water to get to the amount of carbon dioxide that we need to use in the atmosphere to meet the Paris uh, threshold. But I still think that there's a lot of confusion about what types of carbon are better than others. Can we do a question kind of a, a little bit more into kind of what you were starting to describe as the different types of, of CDR? But is there a front runner that you see more corporates uh, considering as the goal of going in terms of the And are they more afraid of some other? This question is for both of you. I'll take a stab at it first. In terms of removals, right? Because I think. Just I'll give you a little case study. Um, the, when I came into my role at first, I was, or I was figuring out how to get us out of the mindset that um, purchasing a credit to protect a tiger in the rainforest was the way that we were going to get our decarbonization targets. Are those important? Yeah, restoration is important. But I think when it comes to removals, there was just the case to be made that removals themselves are even important. So once we got on board with the removal story, I think for us it comes back to how can we tie uh, natural targets, and so then it started to get back into biochar. And I will say that biochar, I think, has probably popped off the most. Um, and then there's a lot of them. I've never said popped off, and it kind of felt wrong. It's <laughs> 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 not very characteristic. But, you know. um, yeah, but I think biochar is really sorry. <laughs> biochar has really done oh, really quite well um, in the market. <laughs> A lot of reasons for that, um, you know, uh, you working at NASDAQ, don't know this with Puro, I mean, Puro has really um, become kind of the registry of choice, and, and a lot of corporate buyers resonate with Puro um, with the index, honestly, the Quarks index that it provides. So for those who don't know, there's a Quarks index that puts a price on biochar, and now if I'm talking about this from a corporate buyer hat, I am going to want to see um, as much pricing data as I can around something, and so naturally, there's a lot more information available around biochar. But I will say, and then I'd love to hear what Ted has to say, is that biochar has been really resonant for us. And then we start to dip our toes into kind of the longer term removals, but again, that's a very different story. If anyone's interested in that word corp, it's a carbon dioxide removal credit, and it stands up the exchanges of fairly two differences that ensure liquidity over time, ensure there's any carbon, and, and math and, 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 and,
currently out there in the world? Yeah, so I think uh, from a ratings agency perspective, as an independent rating agency, they couldn't possibly pick, uh, pick their credit type. Um, but what I would say <laughs> is if you go on the, the Viso Carbon um, platform, you have the premium button, so you can actually order, you can sign up and uh, have a look. Um, there is huge variance in quality between different product, project types um, within them as well. So we do have a, a AAA rated credit, we have one, that is a direct debt capture credit. Uh, but really what you can do is, is look within each of those different credit types and see huge variance in quality. We've got some um, nature based removal credits that are, that are down as a, the B's and the C's and some up in the double A's. So, um, it's not so much like the project type, but then I suppose when you're thinking about it from the demand side, I would, I, I have seen just it, when witnessing the market that Bioshop boom it is very much uh, front and center. I think you're going to see a lot of uh, supply coming on board in the next few years because at the moment I was speaking to a friend of mine who runs Bioshop, um, developer, but he's like Bioshop author in Kenya. Uh, and he's got honestly a queue of, of, of buyers wanting long term wanting to use the base credits. Uh, and I think when you look at the rest of the long term carbon market, it's definitely not the problem that people have. So uh, I definitely see that in the Can I add a fun badge here too? So uh, just now putting on like my risk cap as I'm doing the risk assessment as a buyer too. That's a nice um, question. Yeah. Man, it's almost like the plan that. Um, no, the, uh, the biochar piece is really interesting because there's so many other um, uh, business models that a biochar project could also work with. So in terms of something, like one of the things that I personally look at when we're uh, evaluating projects is what's the total revenue generated from carbon credits alone? That can open an entire conversation that I'm happy to have with anyone after this on financial additionality, but for us it's usually around the 30 to 50 percent max revenue from a project should be coming from carbon credit sales. For biochar, this is really interesting because there's so many other verticals in which a biochar project can work with some of the things in their, in their supply chain, right? For us, we purchased, we did a $5 million deal with the Canadian biochar company, BC Biocarbon. For them, they've got a really nice uh, relationship with a soil provider where they're putting, it's like a blended input um, for one of the outputs of their project. So I think, you know, from a buyer's perspective as well, it's a, like naturally a little bit de-risked because there's so many applications for biochar um, that it also just is an easy story for them to tell. No, I was just thinking, did anyone else catch the next map that you were doing when you're talking about all of the shipping? Is it even tree that goes into even considering the particular project? I mean, if that's what zero really helps corporate buyers navigate, is that metadata, that analysis of the increasing additionality, whether it's development analysis or otherwise? And I'm wondering if you could dive a little bit more into that concept of how do you make a purchase is harder? How do you think the tools? Yeah, so a key product that B0 has is what we call our, our ex ante ratings, which is for projects that are in future review, private, essentially, due diligence reports for, for those projects. Uh, and so the team at B0 is, I think, the biggest science team in, in the market. I, I'm not sure I'll have to ask the team exactly. That makes it about 80 or 90. Yeah, I remember from that conversation. Who would have all the PhDs? Um, and, and so there is. It's a very like, extensive deep DD that goes into this. And there are a number of, sort of segments to that, that diligence that we do. And work with the biggest buyers in the market, like in tech, in finance, in sort of energy. Um, and the additionality point that Meg was talking about, really is central to that. Uh, the permanence point, which I'm talking about durable removals, is obviously important how long that carbon's being um, sequestered for. And then also the carbon housing risk. So is there any other credits and risk? Is there any leakage risk that's in there? And then for those future projects, we also have what we call project execution risk. So in that, we're essentially stripping out the, the diligence process often done by, by um, financial investors and plugging that into our rating to allow us to look at projects ahead of time. And so that sort of matrix of different elements then builds into the, the ex ante rating, which we then deliver. So we're going to wrap down, but I'm about to ask you my favorite question. You're trapped in an elevator with someone else. That means you're already convinced in the one thing about the carbon market space. <laughs> what is it? I agree with you, sorry. Uh, you're in there for an hour. <laughs> this person I'm white. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how you engage with the fairness. Oh, I'll start. Um, I, about the carbon 
Carbon. Those are space or carbon market space? It doesn't matter. Both. Okay, great. You're trapped. Uh, I'm trapped with whoever the ambiguous decision maker is over at SBTI. No. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm going to convince them that uh, <laughs> offsets are uh, an actual complementary strategy and should be included in allowances for corporate decarbonization targets. <laughs> I think I'm going to convince them that over the next five years we're going to see a massive uptick in demand and driven partially by Megan's uh, lobbying of SBTI, I'm sure, but, but mostly by the, the regulatory tipping points that we're seeing in the world over. So Japan, Europe, UK, uh, Brazil, we see all of these, these regulatory regimes which are thinking really keenly about how to integrate these credits and I think that is when we go from this really small mar market and unlock it to the trillion dollar market. And I'm just going to tell them from the next iteration, carbon, you can sell it, so. <laughs> <laughs>